You may have noticed over time that I am wary of um, what I would call certain church speak cliches or what some people might call terms of art that are great for folks who are familiar with the terms but completely alienate other people who never heard the term before or don't know what it means. I don't remember exactly when it was in my church life, but at some point in my church life, someone impressed upon me that churches inadvertently alienate people simply by the words that some churches use. Some of the things are like this. What is that little area between the doors there and the outside closer to the street? Narthex. I feel like I want to have Dr. Rick here from the Progressive commercial, you know, about people becoming their parents saying, Nobody knows what that is. <laughs> this is why I typically call it, you'll hear me call it the lobby. How about the term fellowship? Boy, we use that a lot. Technically, that's what we're doing next week in Mississippi, right? At the swimming event, we're going to have fellowship. But for the person walking in the door for the first time, because that term fellowship is decidedly almost only used in the church context, that new person may be concerned whether they're up to the challenge of doing whatever it is that fellowship entails. So we're going to call next week what it is, at least next week's function, we're going to call it a party. If today you look up the same concept, you'll find that there are other such phrases and words that tend to alienate people. Um, here's a new one. He or she is in a better place. This may or may not be true. We don't really have any way of knowing. We may believe it, but to speak it with such authority, when in fact we don't really know, almost comes across as arrogant to people. And how about this? Have you asked Jesus into your heart? One writer said about this, he says, as many times as I've heard that, I still don't really know what it means. Why my heart? Why not my liver or my kidneys? <laughs> no, seriously though, that, that question seems to kind of pigeonhole Christianity into being mostly an emotional experience instead of a lifelong practice in which we're always endeavoring to improve. Now, if asking someone if they are engaged in a lifelong discipline to orient their lives uh, toward Christ-like compassion, love, and mercy, well, it doesn't have the same ring to it, but that's really what we're supposed to be asking people. And then there's the one you hear me say all the time in one form or another from up here, have you accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior? Now that, of course, stems from a lot of sources, not the least of which in the New Testament is John 3.16, very familiar, where Jesus says, if you believe in him, you will not perish, but you will have eternal life. But this entire idea of believing in Jesus and accepting Jesus, and very often we say trusting in Jesus, requires a robust background in this. Who is Jesus? Jesus. We've done a pretty good job here at the church in making out a logical case for accepting Christ. Most of us here, and I would say most people everywhere, have a really high, wonderful impression about Christ. And when we approach logically what Jesus indicated, you know, that he and God were the same, were one, we're met with only three logical possibilities, two of which, that Jesus was not telling the truth or that he was insane, we don't possibly believe to be true. Therefore, the remaining possibility that Jesus was telling the truth makes it logical for us to accept, to believe in, and to trust Jesus. But still, there's lots more to know about Christ. And Jesus made that abundantly clear during his ministry on the earth. Having that additional knowledge about Jesus is critical if we're going to live our lives on this earth in a way that benefits us and so that we can benefit other people as a result of the fact that we've chosen to accept Jesus and to believe in him and to trust him. This Sunday and for six other Sundays during the summer here at Carrollton, we're going to examine seven things that Jesus told us about himself. They're called the I am statements and they're in the gospel of John. I'm not going to articulate all of them here, but they're things like I am the way, the truth, and the life. Pretty complicated stuff. And today we look at the statement where Jesus said, I am the bread of life. Now recall that when Jesus makes this statement in John, it's shortly after Jesus had just fed the 5,000 
starving people with five loaves and two fish. So bread was on everyone's mind. And Jesus is now trying to direct the minds of those people away from the kind of bread that satisfies hunger for just one day toward the type of substance that gives life to body and to soul for eternity. Bread is kind of universally seen as a staple of life. Even in our current culture, if you can't get bread, you're probably going to have a hard time getting other foodstuffs that you need to survive. No food, we perish. If Jesus then is the, metaphys the metaphorical bread of life, he's saying without him, we perish spiritually. And much of the matter that perishing physically is not recoverable, there is no coming back from complete spiritual death. Of what good is it to know that Jesus is the bread of life? What good is it for you? What good is it for other people? And it's this. The answer lies in Jesus' sacrifice on the cross where Jesus, the Lamb of God, takes away the sins of the world. Our deepest and most pressing problem, our sins, absent Jesus' sacrifice, would, they would result in a separation from God. Jesus removes all that. He eliminates the separation by lifting the load of sin off of our shoulders and putting it on his own shoulders. Our sins are no longer held against us. This is good for you. This is good for me. And this is good for others to whom we can express the truth about the sacrifice of Jesus. The results of the cross, according to Scripture, are here on earth we have new lives, and we also have eternal life in heaven. Just contemplate that for a moment. That's some really good bread. I'll contend that Christians partaking of that spiritual bread, you and I, we can become the bread of life for other people by sharing the truth of Christ with them. Think about a time when someone else that you know fed and nourished your life beyond cooking you dinner. They've nourished you spiritually. They nourished you emotionally. People like that love you. They teach you. They care for you. They encourage you. And we feel fed by those people. You know people like that. When you spend time with them, you come away feeling fed and full spiritually. So let me ask you this. When have you been that kind of bread in someone else's life? We should expect as Christians that we're to do that routinely. I don't mean offering advice on business or the stock market or people that I know that you should know. All of that kind of stuff is temporary. We need to instead be offering an introduction to Jesus. And if allowed, then a discussion concerning the bread of life that is Christ. In that way, Jesus, in addition to being the bread, is like the starter batch for sourdough bread. If you know anything about starter batches, and Gary, correct me if I'm wrong on this, a starter for like sourdough bread can come from like 100 years ago. And it's, it's used and it's reused and it travels down the line. It's passed on generation to generation so that all bread down the road that uses that starter is from the original source. Consider Jesus to be the starter batch in each of us. Jesus has given us the recipe and the starter to become like he is so that we can become the bread of life for the world by giving the world Jesus. So what kind of spiritual bread have you been eating these days? Does it leave you hungry and undernourished? Is it sustaining and enduring? Or has it become hard and dry? It's not biblical, but I think it's true. You are what you eat. If we want life, and want to be life to others, then we need to be consuming the bread of life, Jesus, every day, all day. Let us pray. Jesus, you are the bread of life. 
Lord, we consume so much that distracts us from that reality. We're full and overwhelmed with other aspects of the world where we can't take another bite and we've missed accepting you into our life and filling us with you first and foremost. Lord, help us to avoid doing that. Help us to be ready every morning when we awaken to accept you into our thoughts, into our actions, into our souls, Lord, as you are the bread of our lives. Amen.